Council for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy here in Cairo. I just returned here about uh, three months ago, and I am so delighted that I was able to get here in time for the Cairo Jazz Festival. Um, I would have been able to attend some of the workshops and performances, and there are so many performances to applaud, but I would specifically like to call out those by three talent, uh, talented visiting American bands, which we supported this year as the U.S. Embassy. That's Joyo, the ICX Jazz Ensemble, and Ayman Fanous. And equally deserving of the applause are the individuals and partners who organized the Cairo Jazz Festival this year. So please join me in giving it up for Amro Saleh, who is the Jazz Festival Director and Amro's wonderful team. Tarek Atia, uh, who's the director of the Cairo Cultural Center and the host of the festival. And of course, the AUC School of Continuing Education, led by tonight's speaker, Dean Jim Ketterer. Thank you, Jim, for having us all. I also want to quickly acknowledge my own U.S. Embassy cultural team, led by Rachel Leslie, who's been working closely with Jim, as well as our Deputy Chief of Mission, Nicole Champagne, who's joining us here tonight and our ambassador, Jonathan Cohen, and all of them have uh, been actively supporting the Cairo uh, Jazz Fest and also attending some of this week's activities and events. Now, as an American diplomat myself, I've been looking forward to tonight's talk about jazz diplomacy exactly because it's being led by Jim. As noted, Jim's the dean of the, uh, the uh, School for Continuing Education at AUC, but he's also a drummer, he's a jazz enthusiast, a jazz lover, who has researched and lectured about jazz dip uh, diplomacy for many years. And I know that we share a love of jazz because in the early communications that we had, it was, of course, about the strong relationship between the U.S. Embassy and the School of Continuing Education, but it was just as much about great venues for jazz. And we found out that we share some uh, favorite venues like uh, uh, one on Christopher Street in the West Village. And I have to say, this uh, very hall is, is a great one. And then for those of you who didn't know, uh, in 1937, Um Kulsum herself gave a concert just right next door in Ewart Hall. So uh, we really have some history here with us. Um, I'm going to uh, skip ahead. J uh, I will just say that um, Jim's going to tell us all about how jazz uh, was at the center of U.S. cultural diplomacy at the height of the Cold War. And shall I say tonight's lecture will be followed by a film screening titled In His Own Sweet Way. It's about David Bru Dave Brubeck, who's a significant contributor to American jazz diplomacy from the 1960s until his death in 2012. And as a student, and where some of you are now, about when I was a student back uh, in, at Tufts University in the 90s, I was really honored to get to meet Mr. Brubeck. And the, the title of tonight's film really does reference his own sweet approach to life, music, and cultural diplomacy. So it's wonderful to be among friends tonight. Um, I wanted to do a pitch for one of my favorites. Uh, my friend uh, Maria Golia is the author of Ornette Coleman, The Territory and the Adventure, which was published last year by Reaction Books. And I mention this because Ornette Coleman's free jazz style is something that Jim's called a treasure of the art form. And we're gonna be learning some more about that tonight, about um, these different art forms and the specific American unique jazz uh, art form. So I wanted to uh, call this to your attention, and I'd like you to now please join me in welcoming another very sweet person, Jim Ketterer. Uh, thanks, Jim, for, for, for helping us uh, learn more tonight about jazz diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren, uh, and thank you to Amaro and the, all the team at the Jazz Festival, to the School of Continuing Education, uh, the Tahrir Cultural Center, um, and many, many others who are involved with this jazz festival. It's uh, my third or fourth time of being involved in this jazz festival, and it really is um, an amazing event and brings people and musicians uh, from around the world, and it's not an easy thing to do. So really, the people who have put this together have worked so hard behind the scenes, and this is the first time that I've ever given a talk as part of a jazz festival, and um, so I, I hope I can live up to the very high standards of, the, of this festival. And, um, and I'm really happy to have some actual professional diplomats in the audience who can, um, I'm sure, weigh in more on the, the diplomacy part of, of this. And we have jazz musicians here who can weigh in the jazz part of it. So I'm going to talk about the combination of those two. 
and I'm also going to, this is not my computer, and I'm going to have all kinds of problems with the tech. But let's see how this works. Uh, and I've been given really good instructions on how to do this, and I've probably forgotten most of them. But let's see. I'm also going to stand up, because I like to stand up. Let me see if this works. It works. Okay. Voila. So the title, you know, academic titles can often, they always have to have a colon in the title. So, uh, of course, I put one in to just give it a little academic spin. Um, but what I'm really interested in, in this, as the title says, is, is not just the diplomacy kind of like from America out to the world, but how this is also reflective in a way that I think good diplomacy is, too, of what was going on and in many ways still is going on in, in the United States. And so we'll get into those specifics. Um, but I want to start the story with a few key people, and I'm going to jump around a little bit in terms of chronology, but I want to just kind of paint a picture, um, and then we'll get down to some specifics, and we'll even hear a little music. So this is a very famous member of the U.S. Congress from the middle part of the 20th century, Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. There is a street still named after him in Harlem, the part of New York City that he represented. And he was really a key to this story of jazz diplomacy because he, as a good member of Congress and as a leading African-American politician at the time, um, and as somebody who was just really kind of had his finger on the pulse of a lot of things, in the midst of the of the beginning of the Cold War, not the midst of it, but the beginning of the Cold War, when the propaganda uh, tempo was really heating up between the Soviets and the Americans, and there, were a, there was a lot of what we would now call fake news going back and forth, Congressman Powell said, you know, my district, Harlem in New York City, is a place that represents really some of the very best of the United States, and in fact, it's something that is different than the way that the Soviets are talking about us, and maybe we ought to use some elements of that, and in particular, jazz, as a way to re represent the United States around the world. And he was drawing on the Harlem Renaissance, a multi-decade uh, intellectual, artistic, cultural phenomenon that wasn't really just in Harlem, but Harlem was the epicenter in many ways, and was the result of many African Americans who had moved up north from the southern part of the United States as part of something called the Great Migration. And many people, as part of the Great Migration, ended up in Harlem, in that particular neighborhood in New York City. Um, and I am a New Yorker, so I, uh, if, I, if I use too much shorthand about the city, uh, stop me, raise your hand, and say, what are you talking about? But the, um, it's not the only place that people ended up in the Great Migration, but it was a particularly important place, and it just so happened it was the place that Congressman Powell represented. And under the heading that all politics are local, he was also representing his district in a very good way. This jumps ahead a little bit in the chronology, but I, I find this to be such a compelling picture I wanted to show it, because at the same time that Congressman Powell wants to t use the Harlem Renaissance and jazz in particular as an example of some of the kind of the best and most inclusive forms of American culture, we have some very distinct ugliness going on in the United States. Um, this is from 1957, and is the integration schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. And let me see if this works. This may or may not work. Well, I can't use the pointer, but you can see some very angry people in the crowd. You can see that this is a, an extremely tense situation, and it was beyond just this what this picture captures. I mean, it was a complete kind of meltdown in many ways, required the National Guard being brought in. And I'll just say something to keep in mind as we go forward in the story. Some of the jazz musicians we're going to talk about initially refused to work with the U.S. government because of what was going on in places like Little Rock. It took some time, some negotiations, and some ways that we'll talk about that made it more palatable for them to do it. But the, the, the tensions were extremely high um, throughout this period that I'm talking about. 
And the Soviets were finding all sorts of ways to represent the United States in uh, the most kind of ugly way. And um, you can kind of leave it to yourselves to decide if things like this are propaganda or they're a true reflection or whatever. I'm not taking a position on that. I'm just saying these, these are the sorts of things that were out there. Um, and at the same time, we also see moments of progress. So this is also from New York City. And this is uh, a game that's not really played that much in Egypt. It's played a little bit out in Mahdi, um, but uh, not that much otherwise. And uh, this is the game of baseball. And at this particular time in American history, baseball was the predominant sport. And up until 1947, if you were African American, you couldn't play in the top professional league. You were prohibited from playing. And so the person wearing the Dodgers uniform from Brooklyn in New York, Jackie Robinson, in 1947 was the first African American to break what they called the color barrier, the color line. And he was the first player. The other team he's playing against is the New York Yankees. I'll just say on a personal note, this is a very famous game between these two teams in the World Series. Jackie Robinson is, for those baseball fans out there, stealing home. And my father was at this game, one of his early memories. He says, by the way, Jackie Robinson was out, but he was called safe. Anyway, it's a hugely important moment. And it was all happening in New York and happening at the same time that things were making some progress, but also ugly. And so with Powell's urging and with then some people at the State Department and in other places in the U.S. government, they, they had this idea that jazz was not only a representation of, a, of what was then considered a particularly American art form, and we'll talk about how it's considered later, but also that the f formation, I mean, the, the, the form of jazz, the structure of jazz is inherently democratic. And in simplistic form, I would just say that maybe many of you are, are jazz fans. You're here at the Jazz Festival. I know we have jazz musicians in the audience, but assuming no knowledge, I would just say that when jazz musicians get together, and they decide they're going to play whatever song, there's a certain structure that they're all following. The, there's a melody, there's a chordal structure, there's a rhythmic structure, there's a tempo. They decide on that. But within that structure, everyone gets to say something. It's a conversation. Back and forth, everyone is participating in this conversation. And the democratic idea about this in the 1950s as it was going to be sent outward to the world was that form structure is sort of like the Constitution or something like that. It's a civil society. And then within that, people are conversing, debating, going back and forth, having their say. And that jazz, as a format of music, represents that sort of democratic spirit. Again, you can agree or disagree about the democratic spirit of the United States at that time or of jazz, but I'm just telling you that the historical record shows that that was a lot of the thinking that went into it when they were deciding to kind of promote this particular sort of music, in addition to the fact that it was also just hugely popular and would get people's attention. So... This is one of the, the famous photos of jazz musicians at the time um, <clears throat> in Harlem. One interesting side note about this photo is that the, the photographer apparently tried several times to take the photo and was not able to get all the musicians together at the same time. Um, and the only way it could work is that if he, were, he was there pretty early in the morning when they were coming back from their gigs. And there's an, actually like a 10-minute documentary you can see on YouTube on the making of this photograph and what went into it. It's really quite, to me at least, quite fascinating. Um, but there in Harlem, we had this incredible collection of some of the, the best musicians in the world at the time. And one of them 
was Duke Ellington. I know I spoke to somebody in the audience here who's from Washington, D.C., and so Duke Ellington is not originally from New York. He's a Washingtonian. But he and many others came from all over the country and moved to New York um, to be part of this kind of flowering of the art form and of culture. And his band is one of the, the ensembles that bridge the gap between the pre-World War II era and post-World War II, but he underwent a very interesting artistic transformation, and one of the things I'm going to talk about is the role of him being a jazz ambassador in that transformation as a composer and, and as a player. This is another one of, of the famous jazz diplomacy photos and one of the people who participated in it, Dizzy Gillespie. Um, I just love this photo, and he had a very particular sort of character. He was a good person to send out on the road. He was really going to dive into the experience. Um, I also want to say, for those of you who might be policy wonks in the crowd, um, that as it got into the 60s, that this really became the domain of what was a separate agency that was also working on diplomacy, the U.S. Information Agency. This, a this agency was done away with in the post-Cold War era in 1998. Um, it was done away with. Uh, some people still bemoan its loss. Other people think it was a good thing. But they were fully involved in it. The, the jazz diplomacy tours tend to be called State Department tours, but those people that I worked with who worked for with USAIA sort of bristle at that a little bit, so um, I thought for honesty's sake I should at least mention this. And again, in the policy wonk portion of the talk, um, there is an interesting kind of separate argument to be made about the conduct of cultural diplomacy being done by a separate institution. Um, and that maybe they had more flexibility to do other things than kind of big State Department would do. I leave that to the diplomats here to, to really sort that out. But it's a, in the literature about diplomacy, it's the kind of thing that people are debating, um, USIA versus State Department and public diplomacy. But they were heavily involved in the sorts of things we're going to talk about. It wasn't also just... Um, musicians going around the world that I'm going to show you, but also radio. And radio, I think, is still important, but it was pre-internet days, for those of you old enough in the room to remember such a thing. Um, radio was really incredibly important, and the Voice of America had this guy, Wallace Conover, as uh, the jazz DJ, whose voice went out around the world, and he played this kind of music that people often had not heard of before, and they were quite fascinated by it, and um, that this really had a tremendous reach and garnered a lot of interest, even to places where musicians were never going to show up. There was never going to be a, a, a concert. They could tune in on small little transistor radios and hear Wallace Conover and Voice of America, and American jazz um, at the time. And I say American jazz because that was the focus, but going forward, it won't just be American jazz. Controversial figure by this point in his life. I mean, he's one of the people who is really at the epicenter of the beginning of jazz and is one of the central figures in the art form in general. But as he got on um, into his career, he also kind of crossed over into other kinds of music and was known for songs like um, Hello, Dolly, and What a Wonderful World. And that some people, particularly younger people who were involved in the civil rights movement at, at that time, thought that he was sort of a sellout um, in a way. Now, I would say that, that I think the record shows that that's not the case, that he was just as interested in progress in civil rights, but he was of a different generation, and he also was a musician, and he was, you know, he was making his career and playing all different sorts of music, um, and so some people thought he was a musical sellout, some people thought he was a civil rights sellout, um, but I think he ended up really doing some very interesting things and provocative things that we're going to, to see, um, and he was doing it at a time when, again, go back to Little Rock and other things, we can just see encapsulated in this picture 
um, the, the state of play in a good portion, uh, a notable portion of the United States um, at the time. And um, for those of you interested in this time period and race relations and the civil rights movement in the United States now and before, um, I highly recommend this book, one of the great American novels ever, um, but certainly of that period. And there's, I'm going to violate a rule of mine um, about using PowerPoint just this one time um, because uh, there's some evocative language that I'm, <clears throat> that is part of this book that is, I think, central to this story as well. I'd like to hear five recordings of Louis Armstrong playing and singing, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue, all at the same time, oh, and singing all at the same time. Sometimes now I listen to Louis while I have my favorite dessert of vanilla ice cream and slow gin. I pour the red liquid over the white mound, watching it glisten and, the, and vapor rising as Louis bends that military instrument into a beam of lyrical sound. And I particularly love that bends that military instrument into a beam of lyrical sound. And so the trumpet, which was a military instrument, and the drums and other things initially, through jazz, that lyrical sound, and then being used in this way as jazz diplomacy. Now I'd like to stop talking for a minute and do something much more interesting, which is, let me put this down for a second. thing that's mentioned in that, in that Ralph Ellison passage is the song Black and Blue, which is a song by Fats Waller, um, who was a songwriter in the, in the early part of the 20th century. And this particular song was almost always performed by Armstrong when he was on these jazz diplomacy tours. It was very rarely performed by him back home in the United States. And when I play the lyrics, you'll hear that he's using this song as a way to show a different side of America through his music. That the, these are pretty provocative lyrics. And and I'm going to play it. I'm, now, I apologize ahead of time. We're all here, we're music fans. I'm gonna cut this off. All the videos I'm gonna show, I'm gonna play part of them, which I know is a cardinal sin. I'm gonna forgive me for only playing part of them, but I can't take all the time and play this whole. I'll just say this is in, Ber in, in Berlin, East Berlin in 1961. So he's singing this. There's other, many other videos of him singing overseas. There's one of him in Ghana, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah is in the audience and sobbing at this song. The band will start off and they'll play through the beginning of the melody and then he'll come in and sing. Um, so we'll... Thank you very much, folks. Here's one of our recordings. Is the volume okay? A number called Black and Blue. Yes, Even the mouse ran from my house. They laugh at you, scorn you too. What did I do to be so black and blue? Yes, yes I'm like. 
inside. But that don't help my case. Cause I can't hide what is in my face. But I don't see how would it end? Ain't got a friend. My only sin is in my skin. What did I do to be so black and blue? Very powerful lyrics. The only sin is in my skin that don't help my case, my face. Um, and, you know, the, the brilliance of s seemingly simple lyrics. What did I do to be so black and blue? Kind of means three things at the same time. Talking about being black. Um, black and blue um, as... You know, when you get bruised, you're black and blue. And then blue, if you're sad, depressed, the blues, all wrapped up in that, in that lyric. And, um, you know, I think through playing this as on an official tour for the United States to foreign audiences, that I think this lives up to... Um, I, I once worked for one of the people who was from USIA, became an ambassador, one of the, I think famous people from kind of the annals of cultural diplomacy, Robert Gassende, and he said, if it's going to be effective diplomacy, it has to show the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you lie, you're engaged in propaganda. If you don't show it, warts and all, people won't really listen to you because they know it's not authentic. And I think what we just heard is pretty authentic. Um, it's pretty powerful stuff. And um, definitely something that I think would get people's attention. And, and I think it's also really to the great credit of the people who are programming these tours that they didn't, tr I don't, I've never seen any record where they tried to stop Armstrong from singing songs like this. And so it's really, I think that's really kind of noteworthy. Now back to Ellington, what I think is also noteworthy is that you know, when you send great musicians, wherever they're from, out into the world, you know, their ears are open. They're listening. They're meeting musicians. Just like here at the Jazz Festival, you've got this mix of musicians that are not only performing on the big stage, but they're getting to know each other and having jam sessions and hanging out with each other or listening to other musicians who maybe aren't part of the festival but are here in Cairo. And so when you send somebody like Duke Ellington around the world he ends up coming home and composing music and putting it together in albums like this. And this is one of his very famous albums. And one of the songs on this album, um, it got my attention because I was in California giving a version of this talk a few years ago. And at the end of the talk, somebody in the back stood up and said, oh, I, I don't have a question, but I just want to make a comment. And usually that means something not good is going to follow, um, at least in my experience to me. And he, uh, but it was really quite good what he said. And he said that when he was very young, Duke Ellington and his band came to his town and that he had no idea who Duke Ellington was. He had no idea what jazz was, knew nothing about it. But he knew there was some excitement about this, and he wanted to go hear the music. But his parents didn't have any money, and he couldn't go. But they went, he and his friends went down to the arena where they were playing. I think it was an outdoor arena. And they listened through the fence. And he said, that, what I heard was so wild and different and captured my imagination. And I just thought... I want to learn more 
about this place. So he went home and told his parents, and they said, well, you ought to go, go down the street to the American Library, and you can learn something about it. So he did, and they gave him some books to read, and for some reason, they gave him uh, a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is a, um, from, no, the Gettysburg Address, I'm sorry, the Gettysburg Address, given by Abraham Lincoln. It's a very short but very famous speech. And he's, when he's speaking to me, he's now, I think, probably in his 80s. He's at this event, and he reaches into his jacket pocket, and he said, and it was this exact copy. I carry it with me. I've moved to the United States. I got my PhD here. I raised a family. And he said, I can't exactly say that Duke Ellington brought me here. He said, but I remember that moment, and it set me on that path. And it was just such a fascinating story. And he grew up, and this incident took place in Isfahan, Iran. Um, and one of the songs on this album is Isfahan, that Ellington went there once. And so I just love the image that... Ellington was so moved by whatever experience he had in Isfahan that he wrote this song, and this young boy, now an older man, was also moved by it. They never met each other in person, but they are connected. I think, <clears throat> I think it's very powerful. And, you know, this kind of became a business in a way, too. Like, jazz ambassadors, they put out a lot of albums, and it was sort of a cool thing. Um, but the idea that the music would, would be affected and would come home and bring it home to Americans. And I, again, I defer to the diplomats in the audience, but I think that's always the hope, right? That w the work you do overseas is also going to have a positive effect back home. You're not just out here laboring in the vineyard with no effect. And so the music definitely has um, an effect. And I'm sure for the bands that are here for this festival now and are going to go back to the U.S., will in one way or another manifest that in some way, artistically. Now, there's going to be a movie later, as Lauren said, about Dave Brubeck and his quartet. Um, and I, but they are... I'm going to for, I'll play just a little bit of his music because there's one particular song, but there's many songs that he did that illustrate this idea that the things they heard overseas, they put into their music, and they brought it back to the United States and... Brubeck, my parents are musicians, and so when they were young, Brubeck was very popular. And um, my parents met Brubeck, as you did too, at a college. Uh, he did these famous college tours around the United States, colleges and universities. One of the reasons he did them is because you can see that the bass player in his band, Eugene Wright, was African-American. And he wasn't allowed to stay in the same hotel as the rest of the band in many states that they went to. And Brubeck said, then we're not going to play in those places. We'll go to the places where we can go as a band. And so he did these famous college tours. And he was able to take some of his music, particularly the stuff with um, influences from overseas, and they became big hits, like, you know, radio hits, something that's hard to imagine now. But it really did happen. And a lot of young people would listen to it um, that weren't even just, you know, avowed jazz fans. This particular song, even just the name of it, part of it, is Blue Rondo a la Turk. And <clears throat> the rhythms being used here are things that he imported from somewhere else. It's a very similar rhythm, actually, to what uh, Bernstein used in uh, West Side Story. 
and um, he was classically trained, also a jazz musician. But the key here is that when you go around the world, their ears are open, they're listening. Sorry to cut that off. Uh, it's great stuff. Um, but I just love that, that this is the kind of music that was being brought back from overseas. And they, the, the Brubeck Quartet, this particular period in Brubeck's history, was you know, sort of a, kind of the, the height of jazz diplomacy in, in many ways, and that he was touring with an integrated band, and that he was coming back and, and writing music, and, and it was becoming a big hit with all these foreign influences, I think just says so much about how it can really work um, properly. Now, I just want to say briefly that it wasn't just jazz. So I don't want to sort of overreach on this. There were other musicians touring. There were other things happening. It's Van Cliburn, who was a pianist from Texas, who entered into the Tchaikovsky competition in the Soviet Union and won it. Um, sort of like a surprise dark horse candidate. And he, he won it and um, for the rest of his life was an enormously popular figure with the Russian people. I mean, you can just see these faces, these adoring faces. Um, even late into his career, he would go back, even when he wasn't playing anymore, would go back, and the Russians just absolutely adored him. The Canadian pianist Glenn Gould also made a very famous and provocative tour of the Soviet Union in the 1950s. He wasn't allowed to play certain music in the big halls, but he would do workshops um, with students in the conservatories, and then he would just let it rip and play all sorts of stuff. He was a very special kind of character. Um, and so it wasn't just jazz musicians. We're focusing on that here, but I want to give other musicians uh, their due. Now, before I conclude, the last thing I want to talk about, though, is that I had started... This was a very, a very American-centric talk at the beginning, and I think it's fair to say that historically it was a very American-centric art form, but it was created many other places and brought to the United States sort of in this cauldron of, of culture and difficulty and struggle. And then, but it also went out to the world and became other things. And so we can see here a picture of one of my friends, Amro's friend, at the Cairo Jazz Festival many years ago, uh, K.J. Dennert. And her band is interesting, I think, but like some of the bands we see here ton, um, at this festival, because they're from all over the place. And it's not just say, okay, this is an American band and this is a band from Luxembourg or something. You know, the people are from all over the place and the musical inf influences are from all over the place. And I think it also bears noting that... Um, for all of the musicians and the bands that I've been showing up to this point, oh, there were no women that I was showing. And while there were some women singers, usually, that jazz, for all of its other progressive qualities, for a long time was lagging behind in being inclusive for women. I think that has really caught up, and there's, um, there's not only 
great women musicians who are, who are making that catch-up happen, but also are, have formed organizations that are making sure that it continues on with next generations. But um, KJ is, is one of those people, and she's uh, really uh, great, and you know, she brings a different kind of contemporary sound to the... I'm going to play just a little bit of it so you can just hear... Um, Have a good night, everyone. KJ's family's from Jamaica. Her bass player's from Senegal. Um, other band members are from all over the world. They're based in New York City. Sorry to turn that off. You should go check out some more KJ Dennert. She's really great. She's really great. Um, well, I want to wrap up pretty quickly, but I want to just say a couple more things because there's, I think there's one more important piece of the story, and that is that the, the last step of it is that... So I've still been focusing on bands that are coming from the United States, even if there's more women involved and people from all over the place. But... When you send people out into the world, when you send radio transmissions out into the world, there are going to be other musicians who hear the music, who, who know of this history, who know the art form, and they make it their own. And they turn it into their own, and we can see many examples of that. We can see many people who are influenced by it um, who weren't even musicians and didn't become musicians. I mean, when Mikhail Gorbachev was um, on the rise and about to become in charge in the Soviet Union, one of the things that made people feel like, well, you know, we can work with this guy is that he had grown up listening to Wallace Conover and Voice of America and jazz, and like, you know, he's a jazz fan. We, we, we can work with him. Um, but I think more substantially is that musicians around the world heard this and turned it into their own art form in their own way infused with their own histories, their own kind of musical training, certain bands like, like this one. Um, I think we know about them. If you don't know about them, I highly recommend you, you check them out because they're very, very good, and they're exactly what I'm talking about, and you can see examples of this in lots of other places. So I just want to conclude by saying, so jazz diplomacy even as carried out by the United States and by other places, is not just something in history, that it continues today. Um, we, just the other night, had some of the School of Continuing Education high school students here to, to see the American band, Ajoyo, to have a workshop with them, to meet, the, uh, to meet Lauren, to meet Ambassador Cohen, um, and that it was a really very special evening for all of us. This is a picture of another band that came to the Cairo Jazz Festival, supported by the U.S. Embassy, and uh, the Art Stanton Quartet with AXA students there. I was looking at this picture this morning. I was thinking, oh, you know, th this was nine years ago or something. I I'd love to 
meet up with these access students at the time, but I think you really get a sense of the excitement. And that, so they, they had a workshop with the students earlier in the day, that band, and then that evening, the students were in the audience as they played in, in Azhar Park. And it was just really, a, that's a picture taken from the side of the stage, just a special evening because those students felt connected to those musicians. And those musicians, who are friends of mine, um, they were like, wow, this is like, it's like I'm in the Beatles or something now. You know, nobody's ever asked, I'm a jazz musician, no one's ever asked for my autograph before. And um, it was a really, it was a great connected experience. And that band, the Arch Stanton Quartet, went home, wrote an album that has a whole suite of music on it called the Lady Egypt Suite. And so it's another example of just exactly that phenomenon. And we end where we began with the most iconic photo um, that's in Lauren's office. The original, right? I don't know. It's the original. But it's like, this is, this is it. This, is, this really um, kind of embodies it in, in many ways. And of course, it's back here at Umadunya. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. Do we have, I'm going to, do we have time for a couple questions? Yeah? Okay. Because I know, and please do stay for the, the movie that's going to, to come. And we have a mic here if anybody wants to ask a question. Don't be too shy. It's just jazz. <laughs> no? Okay, good. Yeah, well, I, I really want to thank so much uh, James Ketter for this wonderful uh, presentation and lecture about jazz diplomacy. Thanks so much for this. That was very, very, very deep, and thorough, and lovely to, to show this um, history about uh, all these great musicians and their contributions. Um, to jazz and and to diplomacy and like to, and to um, um, well I don't know I don't know if this word is correct like to promote the U.S. like in like abroad in 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 this period of time uh, I also would like to thank so much Lauren Lovelace for this uh, um, introduction and being here it's 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 very it's a great privi privilege for for us. And um, yeah, I, mean, I really feel very much uh, happy that that I'm 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 witnessing this like and, and seeing this presentation happening in in this edition this year. Thank you so much, James. Well, thanks Thank for you. having us here. Thank you. And and I, I just want to mention, you know, you use the word promote, and I, I do want to get, you know, there really is a controversy about it. This idea that you know promoting means sort of glossing over um, the difficulties. And I want to go back to that idea that I think, and I think it's borne out by the evidence, that you have to show warts and all. You have to show the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is good to show, and we saw it. But, you know, when I, I've given this presentation, versions of it, quite a few times, and I, I, still, I still find, you know, Armstrong singing that song. It's very emotional. Sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice uh, lectures. But uh, this, this photo uh, <clears throat> attracted my attention to in, uh, because I'm a little bit old. In 1950, there was uh, a jazz music played in Cinema Rivoli by, uh, I, I, I think, uh, maybe. Uh, some from the group from uh, Lewis Armstrong and dancing water. Water was going up and down with flute. So this was played in this uh, time. In the, in the fifth, early 50s, you said? Yeah, 50, yeah. 51. Yeah, before the revolution. And uh, this was played in the cinema Rivoli. We, we enjoyed to go there, uh, especially for this uh, uh, jazz music. Thank well, you. 
I mean, there were times when Armstrong toured around the world when it wasn't part of the U.S. government. I mean, he was, you know, I, he was very famous already, so he was touring around and doing things. I think, I think he passed by Egypt. I think he did too. Yeah, I think, because I, in, I, as I recall, but, in my in my early stage, I remember we we went to Saint Marie to because uh, he's playing uh, jazz uh, by Armstrong. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I don't think this was his first time in, in Cairo. I, I think this might be 1960, but I'm not sure. 61, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for the correction. And um, if I'm not mistaken, maybe this lady is Josephine Baker. Oh, no, this is his wife. His wife. His yeah. wife, yeah. Uh, Josephine Baker was... Uh, a little bit dark, so... I right, guess. but uh, th this, is, this is his wife. Yes, yeah. Very nice photo. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Thank you. Um, Jim, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, fascinating and... Sorry, I, can, I don't know if you can hear me with this mask. Yeah, I can. Um, incredible talk and, and really insightful. Uh, who, who do you think is winning the debate right now that has been going on since uh, jazz diplomacy started about whether to, to tell a story in all its aspects and, or whether to just kind of tell some parts of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a broader um, debate, not just about jazz or even just about cultural diplomacy, but about the conduct of diplomacy overall. And... Um, you know, the, for people who are looking at kind of like the, inf, who study the information flow from diplomacy, you know, kind of, I would say, separate from the maybe attached but not the same thing as the cultural diplomats or the people, you know, doing press stuff and all of that, kind of the information side of things. Um, you know, there's plenty of cases where every, particularly in the Cold War, but not only them, where, you know, not just the United States, every country is engaged in gamesmanship um, on, on information flow. And then it's, as I said, it goes back to this distinction between, well, what's propaganda, what's not propaganda. Um, but I continue to think that, like, what, what ends up being really effective are the things that people feel is authentic in some way or another. And the only way that can happen is if you're not glossing things over. So I, my sense is that there's, there's really kind of an ebb and a flow to these sorts of things. But, um, you know, there's lots of other kinds of cultural diplomacy that are happening, including, I mean, this embassy is very active in doing all sorts of things. And so, you know, there's hip-hop and there's visual artists and there's, there's writers. And, you know, when I, I used to work at Amadeist, when I was there, and the, the embassy in those days would, would send, if they had a poet in town, the poet would come over to Amadeist and we'd round up some students and do, and some of the poetry was pretty provocative that that poet had written. And there was not really, no one was saying pull the punches or do that. So my sense, you know, I work for AUC. I don't work for the U.S. government. My sense is that the, the people that I've known who are doing this work, that they, they, um, they know that, that they have to be effective. They have to be real. And then the message has to be real. And the people will just not buy into it if it's not otherwise. So um, I think the results kind of win out. But there's, there are definitely other examples um, from, from anybody engaged in diplomacy. I mean, that's also true of, you know, I mean, any kind of corporation or any institution, you know, has to kind of navigate those waters, I think. Yeah. Lauren, I mean, you, you know more about this than I well, do, I so go ahead. Say, You're doing it. So this is what I've, this is my career as a, as, as in public diplomacy. So um, certainly not censoring or, but, uh, but what we're really trying to do also is to encourage artists or musicians to come to us. It's, you know, the, the, the artists make a decision as Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington to associate with the U.S. Embassy, and that's a big decision. And not everyone, sometimes when I approach someone, they're really surprised that you know, the, the U.S. Embassy would want to, and then we have to, we have to overcome some of these feelings that you know, we're not trying to editorialize. We're, trying, you know, we're just wanting to exactly do that, convey the honesty of their work and their art. So I would just say as a call-out to anyone here who knows any 
Uh, we, we do focus on American, or I, I love what you said, Jim. It is true, like, so the, the Ajoyo. It is American, but then that means so much. That's like, it's Tunisian, it's, uh, it's Moroccan. It's like so many, I think, you know, different, right. uh, different varieties of what it is to be American. So, um, but, but if you know of anyone who you think would be interested in participating in our public diplomacy programs, we're really, really eager to do that, whether it's in literature or film or music or the visual arts. And um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's not it is a challenge, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commitment that we have to trying to find the best and certainly bringing the best here to uh, Cairo. And, you know, and, and there was a documentary made about four years ago. Um, it was a joint effort by the BBC and PBS on jazz diplomacy. And it's generally, I think, a very good film. It tells a lot of the nuances of this story. But my, and, and I met the director, and he's a great guy, but I, I said to him when I met him, too, that my only quibble with it is that, that I think it's historically inaccurate that it positions kind of a, it's got this sort of stock footage of diplomats in a, in a basement looking over a map, and they're trying to, like, conjure up some scheme to propagandize. And it, um, I think it's really kind of, it just doesn't align with my, experience of working with with people and working on programs like this and and I think it's just there's also I mean there's a lot of you know governments create a lot of paper and a lot of archives I mean there's a lot of archives on all of this stuff and you really don't see that in there you know mo most of the archives are have more to do with you know um trying to make sure that the, the bands stay on track and that, you know, you've got to get them up early in the morning. And it's like all the logistics of, like, making a, a tour work. Um, and it's not really about, like, oh, well, we don't want Armstrong to sing that song. or We don't want, you know. I was really interested after I saw that movie. I was like, I, I've got to see. Like, did anybody say, like, oh, you know, Armstrong sang that song last night. We, we can't let him do it anymore. I didn't find anything like that. There's a hand up back there. Hey, Jim. Thanks hey, so much Chris. for the talk. Good to see you. Um, obviously, by necessity, so much of what you were talking about is Cold War era diplomacy. And right. As you were uh, talking, I was taking like a list of notes on my phone of things I now have to go look up when I get home. So thank you for that. Um, I was thinking about were there ever any efforts by the U.S. government at kind of pre-World War II diplomacy? I'm kind of thinking about the way in which ragtime and swing made inroads in the Weimar Republic in Germany. Um, obviously, there's much more robust kind of internationalist American state after World War II, but do you know of any efforts by either the U.S. government um, or allies to try to bring this music uh, pre-World War II and maybe the 20s or 30s? Yeah, I don't... I, um, I, I honestly haven't looked exhaustively into that or, or much at all, but I, I do vaguely recall that in the, the pre-World War II era... Um, particularly the 20s, so before things started to, you know, really get on edge in, in Europe, that, um, you know, uh, as I understand it, uh, in, uh, in particularly in some of the big embassies in Europe, they were, you know, really uh, quite wealthy people who were the ambassador, and they would fund some things themselves, and I think some of them would bring bands over from the U.S. Um, of this kind of music, and it wasn't really kind of a an organized jazz diplomacy effort. I think it was maybe more like, I like this band, or people should hear this band, or this is going to be great at this big party that we have in London, or something. But um, there was some of that. But I, I would like to look more into it. World War II, however, during the war, um, particularly in Europe, and then the kind of the immediate aftermath of the war and American troops staying there, there's two key elements of that. So they they were definitely bringing all kinds of music. There were all kinds of musicians in those military units, and they were playing. And um, a lot of Europeans saw and got to know a lot of African Americans. Um, so that happened by dint of the military effort, but all that an army brings to, an, to being there, and then obviously <clears throat> stayed there for, for a long time, um, but uh, so there was that too, but I don't think that the, though the and the U.S. military still invests a lot in music programs. 
and have you know I mean, world class musicians in the, in those programs. So there was that also. I mean, there were there were organized bands that were there, and some of them were were big bands in the kind of pre World War II style of big bands, and these were really outstanding musicians. I mean, you know, there's the the one song by the uh, the Andrews Sisters, the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but there was a lot of that going on, and then a lot of the people who then formed the post-World War II early bebop movement had served in the military and had gotten to know each other in many cases through that and then came home and you know, headed off in a different direction musically from the, from the big band era. So they're all, that's a long way of saying, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a really good question, but I have some vague ideas about those things, but I, I really should go back. So thank you for kind of prompting me to do that and then look at it. Because there, there were probably more efforts to do it um, than post-World War II. But I also think, just in terms of institutional analysis, that because the U.S. was taking on a different global role post-World War II, it was also organizing itself differently back in Washington to do things like this. Anything more? Well, I think I've gone over time anyway, and we have a movie coming up, so... Thank you again to everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. And um, I know it's not so easy to get around Cairo and get through the traffic, so I really appreciate it. And thanks to Lauren and to Amro and to the SCE staff and to the Jazz Festival staff and Tarek, who was here. Um, I really appreciate it. And I also want to, he's not here, thank the, the tech person because they've put up with me.